have a privacy practice and employment law practice in the Bay Area, and I also do workplace investigations, and I've been hosting these lunchtime legal chats for a few months now. And today we're going to talk about contractors versus employees. And as you know, I've been very fortunate to have DLSA hearing officer Carlos Torres joining me today. Mr. Torres works for the Division of Labor Standards Enforcement, and he has been working in that capacity for more than two years um, as a hearing officer. And he adjudicates wage and hour claims and enforces California's minimum labor standards under the Labor Code and Industrial Welfare Commission wage orders, otherwise known as the California Wage Orders. Prior to his role as a hearing officer, he worked as a deputy labor commissioner for the DLSC in San Francisco. Some of you might know him from that role. And he mediated wage and hour disputes there. He's also a licensed attorney and an undergraduate uh, and a graduate of the USF School of Law. Thank you so much, Mr. Torres, for joining us here. Thank you, and uh, thanks for having me. So with no further ado, we're going to get started. While I pull this up, um, Mr. Torres, maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, we're going to get in depth on our factors today um, and what matters most when deciding to classify employers versus employees. But I wondered if you could briefly talk about, you know, which factors you think are most important today and why, and perhaps any in particular industries that you think are being targeted right now. Uh, well, when you mention factors, uh, we are discussing the case of S.G. Borello and Sons, Inc. versus Department of Industrial Relations, and that's really the, the, the go-to case when analyzing an employee-employer relationship and whether that's, in fact, an employee versus an independent contractor. So there's a lot of things to consider, which uh, I'm sure you'll discuss further during the presentation, but just to sort of get a roadmap of how a case like that is analyzed uh, through the administrative wage adjudication process, first we look at what is the presumption of employment. So under California law, once a plaintiff comes forward with evidence that he's provided services for, uh, for somebody, uh, that employee has basically established a, a prima facie case that there's a relationship of employment. So that's just the presumption that's afforded uh, to that worker under the law. Uh, once that's presented, then the employer can rebut that presumption by showing um, that this worker was an independent contractor and there's different indicia or factors that the law recognizes in making that determination. The, the most significant, um, as you asked, is the, uh, the right of control or the right to control the work details. So that is closely analyzed when, when, um, when analyzing or in the process of making these determinations, as well as 13 other different factors that we will go through. Um, but yes, the most important I would say would be, does that principal have the right to control the work details? And we'll talk more about what that means. Um, these factors cannot be applied mechanically or separately as their own tests. So you do look at all factors intertwined um, and their weight might depend on the particular combinations, and we will discuss what those may be or how that those present themselves in what is currently being uh, referred to as the so-called sharing economy, so that we'll get into more. Uh, I, I don't see that the Labor Commissioner treats specific specific cases regarding these. The most types, the most common types of claims that I see come through this office are misclassifications of uh, workers in the construction industry, um, uh, nail salons, and sometimes even uh, restaurants. So it really depends. There's no targeted industry necessarily, at least through the wage adjudication process. Great. Thank you so much. I think that's really mm -hmm. helpful. And um, we're going to get into that a little more as well. 
So um, a couple of notes about terms. So the term that I'm going to use for the person that employs a contractor as a principal, that would be the person that is paying the, the worker or the consultant or however you want to call them. But that is that person would be a principal as opposed to an employer in the employment context. And then the person providing the services is generally going to be referred to as the worker, sometimes the contractor or the consultant. But I try and use worker because it um, has that generic term. It's not necessarily indicating that the person's a contractor or an employee. So when I, I just want you to understand what I'm referring to when I call someone a worker. So here are some central questions we're going to address, or what are the ethical question, you know, considerations to keep in mind as we review the materials? I did give, um, I did get an approval for an ethics credit today, and so I want to look at this question in the context of ethics for lawyers, and I think it lends itself well to that. But I'm going to try and have that a little bit in the background, um, so something I'm going to bring up as we go but also hopefully will be interesting and relevant to the non-lawyers in the group. Why are we here? What are the factors in classification? As Mr. Torres was talking about, the number of factors we have and which are most important. The advantages and disadvantages. How does the government find out about people being possibly misclassified? What are the penalties if you get it wrong? And what do you do to protect yourself if you have decided to make someone a contractor? So we're going to start with this, this model rule that has to do with how you advise a client. So if you're an attorney, if you represent a client, you can use your professional judgment, and you should, but you are not supposed to refer only to the law, but other considerations as well, such as moral, economic, social, and political factors that may be relevant. And, and this is why I think this topic is such a great one for you know, an ethical look at a lawyer's obligation here because there is so much hubbub about this right now and there are, in my point of view, um, especially with the sharing economy, uh, economic factors that come into play and economic realities. There's political factors because we're going to talk in a minute about all the things that have come up in, you know, the House of Representatives, for example, having to do with uh, classifications and then there's also social factors and then last but not least arguably there are moral factors and that's one thing that Mr. Torres and I were going to keep discussing so you know sometimes it's perfectly appropriate and in fact very important to be talking to your client about these other considerations besides just the law and I think that's particularly true in a law where you are dealing with contractors versus employees where there's no black or white you know, you have just these shades of gray. So why are we here? Well, the federal government is really cracking down in this arena. I'm sure most of you have a natural sense of that. You probably just heard about more companies that are being dinged for violations of contractor versus employee status, misclassifying someone who should have been an employee as a contractor. But there are a lot of formal things that are going on as well that show us this. So for example, in 2009, the, the, um, the accounting office of the government said that $7 billion was being lost um, in, treasury ta in tax revenue for Treasury over the next 10 years uh, for misclassification. And it also stated that for 1% of workers misclassified in any state, they lose approximately almost $200 million in unemployment insurance. So they're... The federal government and the state are really seeing how much money they're losing by people being misclassified um, or classified in a way that the government doesn't approve of, depending on how you want to look at it. And so that is becoming uh, more and more of, uh, of an issue these days. In 2011, the IRS and the Department of Labor combined forces and they executed a memorandum of understanding to conduct joint investigations and share information. And that's going on with the states as well. As of October, of, so this month, the DOL has now 26 states, including California, it has this agreement where if the Department of Labor hears about something that's going on, it will let the DLSC know, for example, and they will both look into things. And this is important because your penalties depend on which agency is auditing you or, or enforcing 
the, um, the, the statutes in question or the wage orders in question. And so if you have multiple agencies enforcing this, you're talking about multiple penalties and you're also talking about being caught a lot more. So for example, maybe, maybe the workers' compensation board dings you because there's something to miss in your workers' compensation policy. Well, now you need to worry about your contractor status as well because they're likely to let the DLSC know that they should be taking a look at whether that has been properly done as well. The state government's also cracking down. In 2012, there was a law passed and um, that added some sections to the labor code. And what it basically said is that anyone who's committed a serious, anyone who's misclassified an employee, if they've done so willfully and made them a contractor that they then have to put on their website that they have committed a serious violation of the law by engaging in a willful misclassification of an employee, and they've gotten dinged with substantial penalties. And um, Hearing Officer Torres, I wondered if you could tell us um, what you are seeing in this regard, if you're seeing this being enforced, and what kind of penalties you're seeing uh, occur here. Uh, well, Yes, the DLSC does have that enforcement authority of, over the the new codes um, that you just mentioned and are in the slide. Usually, what happens is that the field enforcement deputies, as part of, as part of the Bureau of Field Enforcement, they're the ones that go out there and issue citations and penalty assessments and order employers to publicly display uh, notice of any violation of Section 226.8. Uh, willful misclassification can happen in various industries and these are civil penalties they are the public notice of violation and disciplinary action and the most active branch of the DLSC in that regard is the Bureau of Field Enforcement who who goes on site conducts these inspections as either part of a joint task force as part of a routine investigation or based on a lead. So if, if those citations end up being appealed, then they come before me to, to get addressed on the appeal level. So then there's the adjudication of the, of the penalty being assessed if that gets appealed. Um, I've not come across this one particular labor code, um, so I, I cannot say as to whether these are being frequently um, cited codes when deputies are out there, but DLSC does have that enforcement authority. What do you think, um, what do you think goes into defining willful? Is there a key factor or fact pattern that would lead the commissioner to decide that someone has willfully misclassified? Well, generally, you're looking to see if someone voluntarily or knowing, knowingly um, misclassified the worker. And repeat um, violator, so to speak, uh, would that would be evidence of, of, of willfulness. So it really does, does depend on the facts, but we're, we're trying to get to whether this was volun voluntarily or knowingly something that the uh, the purported employer did. Great, thank you. So repeat violations would be one of the key ways of, of seeing that it was willful. So um, how do you know who is which? How do you know who's a contractor, who's an employee? Well, the first thing I think is really important to talk about is that the labor code has a presumption in California that someone rendering services for another, a worker, is presumed to be an employee. So um, the, if, if the worker challenges the classification, then the burden automatically shifts to the employer to prove that they're wrong, that this person was a contractor. So it is an uphill battle for an employer um, to prove that somebody was a contractor because there is a default to them being an employee. So what are the factors that have mattered? Well, it depends partially on which agency is enforcing it, but there are a lot of similarities in the various agencies that enforce. And we're gonna talk mostly today about the DLSC standards because I, I think these are the most uniformly accepted as the key factors, and I think the DLSC does most of the enforcement. But again, um, you know, this, there can be violation 
agreements um, that are enforced by the Workers' Compensation Board or the ADD or some of the other agencies or the IRS for that matter. So the, the DLSE applies what they call this multi-factor test, which is, it's a test that was elaborated in Borello and Sons, which is not, it's a pretty recent case, 1989. It's a California Supreme Court case. And that said, and as this is something that Officer Torres talked about earlier, that the most significant factor is whether the person has a right to control. And how do we tell if somebody has that right of control? Well, these are some of the things we looked at. Are the services performed in an occupation or business distinct from that of the principal? So, for example, if you're an attorney and you hire someone to come paint the outside of your office or the inside of your office for that matter, that's someone who's really engaged in a business that's distinct from yours. By definition, when you don't know the person's business, it's going to be a lot harder to micromanage the business. So. That is one good way of assuring that somebody is a contractor. Is it part of the regular business of the principal or the employer? So in the Uber case, which we're going to talk more about in a few minutes, is the um, thing that happened in Uber is even though there was a lot of ways in which those employees were actually contractors according to some of the other factors here, what the court said is that essentially the contractors were employees because they were really the backbone of Uber's business. Without them, Uber would cease to exist and cease to be what it is. And so they were very much a part of the regular business of the principal um, or the employer. And in fact, um, there are cases, and we're going to talk about one in a minute, where the courts have said, well, it's really hard in this instant to exercise kind of micro control over the employees and I think that would be the case with Uber as well when you're talking about drivers you're you know the the Uber's not in the car with them to tell them what to do how to do it in fact they can even the drivers can even refuse fares for example but they do exercise on a much bigger scale um, all the details of how that operation runs and so by having the drivers be a part of the regular business of the principal than they are employers are employees by that mechanism. Who supplies the instrumentalities, tools in place? If it's the worker, they're going to look more like a contractor than an employee. What's the worker's investment in the equipment or materials? Again, this is this does the service render require a special skill is a lot like are the services performed um, uh, you know, in an occupation or business distinct from that of the principal. And then, you know, to what degree is the work usually done without supervision, the opportunity for profit or loss, depending on the managerial skills. So again, if you say you have a carpenter and they come and they bid on a job in your home, well, to some extent, how efficiently they do the job is going to depend on how quickly they do it and how well they do it in that period of time. What's the length of time? So something that's more temporary is going to look more like contract, contract uh, situation. What's the degree of permanence, which is similar to, to that factor? And is the method of payment by time or by the job? With method of payment by time looking more like an employee by the job, again, thinking of the carpenter example, that's going to look more like a contractor. Somebody who hold themselves, hold themselves out as a business is going to tell you this is what this job costs and um, you, know, you need to write me a check for that amount, period, as opposed to the employer telling them what they're willing to pay. So again, um, uh, there's a couple other cases that are determinative. Toyota versus um, Superior Court said that issuing a 1099 form is not determinative. Determinative. So a lot of times I have employers come to me and they say, hey, you know, I issue a 1099. There's never been a problem. My employee gladly accepts that. My employee wants to be, or excuse me, my contractor wants to be a contractor and not an employee. Um, you know, what's the problem? Well, the courts have basically said it doesn't matter what you think. It matters what, you know, where these factors lay, um, where these factors fall, essentially. So a 1099 form, you know, is just a formality and maybe we'll have some bearing if all the other factors line up well, but it's not determinative. And then this is the yellow cab case I was telling you about, which is a lot like the Uber case in which it said that even if there's absence of control over the details, that there's still going to be found to be an employer-employee relationship 
if the principal retains pervasive control over the operation as a whole, and the workers' duties are integral to that operation. And that, again, was what they found in Uber. And if the nature of the work makes detailed control unnecessary, which arguably was the case in Uber and was the case with cab drivers. So um, here are some advantages of paying your provider like a contractor. First of all, you can save money. Um, there are no mandated contributions. Um, there are no discretionary fringe benefits that you have to give when someone's an employee. And again, those are, are discretionary by definition, but they are oftentimes granted to keep up. I'm sorry, do you have something you want to chime in here with, Mr. Torres? Um, I just wanted to um, add, as this is just to keep in mind as you're going through these advantages, is that uh, these are potential advantages or perceived advantages, and uh, these advantages should not on their own inform any decision to classify someone as a contractor rather than an employee. So you still have to be sure that you're adequately classifying these workers based um, by going through the legal framework that exists um, and, and all of that. And also to the slide regarding the right to control, I just wanted to point out that the courts have recognized that the right to discharge at will without cause is strong evidence in support of an employment relationship. So that falls within the right to control the work details. So that's just something to keep in mind as well. Thank you, I think that's very important. Yes, I mean, you know, usually with a 1099 relationship, you do have some kind of a contract in place. And a lot of times there is an insistence that when the contract's terminated, there's some kind of indemnity paid out or there's some kind of notice given, which is, which is very different than an at-will relationship. Okay, so um, again, you know, the biggest advantage essentially here is that you save money. Um, of course, one of the big reasons that employers like to do it or businesses like to do it is it minimizes liability. There's not, there's not this protective relationship in the employer employee status or in the contractor um, principal status the way there is to um, when you classify someone as an employee. You don't have the same obligations under the law. You're, you're really looked at as two equals who contract for a particular purpose. Um, and Officer Torres, would you like to say something about that? Uh, again, ask me the question again. Oh, no, I just thought you were trying to, to speak. I, I just heard you and I thought you were trying to uh, oh, no. inject something. Okay, interject something. Um, more advantages. Again, these really do come down to cost savings. You know, you don't have to hire an employment lawyer. Arguably, you, you can um, do a lot less record keeping. Um, you don't have to give leaves. But, um, you know, one nice thing about having contractors is, and if, if you really have a legitimate contractor, you're often hiring them as a consultant, and that does allow you to have highly specialized personnel. So that is one of the big advantages of having contractors is that you can have someone come in for a specific period of time who's an expert in a particular area. And then when that job is done, they leave. Um, that's, I think that's a pretty good way to tell that your person is truly a, a, a contractor, not an employee. But the disadvantages are basically, as, as we said before, that there's a presumption of employment. So you've got a big burden to prove that the person is truly a contractor. And there's steep penalties if you get it wrong. Um, so, and we'll go through those. But in order to have the status stick, um, not only do I think you need to have some indicia that the person holds themselves out as a business, but you have to be really careful that you don't start micromanaging them and exercising control over them. So that is a big disadvantage. And of course, one of the other disadvantages, which um, I don't have on my slides, is that you know if you're a risk adverse person, it's always a good idea to just make the person an employee because there does you know there is some anxiety behind it. Um, the other thing I thought would be important to point out is that in the case of copyright or trade secret ownership in the employment context, someone's inventions or 
intellectual property is going to be considered the property of the employer, and that's this vice case that I quote here. But that is not the case if someone's a contractor. There's the presumption actually goes the other way. So that is one factor to think about if you have an industry where intellectual property is important. So how does the government find out and decide to intervene? Well, the biggest way, about 90% of the complaints come up because an individual who's treated as an independent contractor files for unemployment benefits. That's called an obstructive claim because essentially the person's trying to make a claim for unemployment and the EDD says, well, wait, you're a contractor. Contractors don't have a right to get unemployment benefits. But let's take a look and make sure you were properly classified. There's also complaints that are just made right out of the box to the DLSC or to the Department of Labor. And that's where somebody says, hey, I was misclassified, I think, or I wasn't paid overtime, and they don't understand they're not being paid overtime because it's not a right that contractors have. And then that tips off the agency and they say, well, we think you might have been misclassified. There's also tips the labor commissioner gets. Sometimes those tips are that a particular industry is violating this um, misclassifying in general a lot. Um, That's right. And I think that for on that point, um, you know, the tips may come from the public. Uh, the tips may come from another uh, agency that's involved in investigating this this business uh, or through jo joint task force um, shared information. And uh, I would say that the DLSC finds most of their violators by conducting audits and but that's through the field enforcement uh, unit. Um, however, these violations are not directly the result of discovering that someone was necessarily misclassified as a contractor. A lot of the times that just comes up in the course of a regular investigation when the labor commissioner cites employers involved um, in various businesses who conceitedly hire employees or or just workers in general and simply fail to comply with minimum labor standards. So, uh, and then the, the, the defense may be that these workers were, were not employees later down the line. Great. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, um, and just a point of clarification here that, um, um, one of the ways that the government is um, missing out on taxes, per se, um, is when you don't make someone an employee, is that the employer is not paying payroll taxes, for example, or unemployment taxes. And those taxes are probably never paid. Um, the, their, you know, the independent contractor is going to pay, obviously, their inc own income taxes, but there are certain taxes they may choose not to pay, pay like unemployment insurance, for example. Um, and so that's, you know, that's a surefire way the government's going to be missing out by having someone contract, uh, you know, classified as a contractor and not an employee. Here are other ways the government finds out. There's a joint task force between the EDD and the DLSC. IRS initiates an audit, audit of a business. Self-reporting, so you're, there is a law that requires all employers to report new hires, um, and they are supposed to report 1099s as well, so you might report a 1099, um, and then the agency takes a look at it and says, oh, we think this person's actually an employee, or the industry at hand might be targeted. So I know that sometimes it's favorable to, to crack down, like I, I, I was told by a DLSC official that a few years ago, they were really cracking down on the beauty industry that was sort of renting out these spaces to people that were doing hair or, you know, estheticians and that kind of thing. And those people were all contractors pretty much, and they were targeted a lot because in some of these salons, there really was quite a bit of control going on. And um, so that was a, a way that the government was, was missing out. Um, <clears throat> Officer Torres, do you think this is correct? Do you think 90% of the claims come up from these obstructed claims, or do you think other other methods are more important? Uh, I think that they come up in, in various ways. I think that because, since we're discussing the sharing economy, that can be sort of an elusive concept. Um, it's It's 
difficult to target someone in that industry. Just that's just my opinion. But just generally speaking, underground economies um, could be misclassifying or frequently do misclassify workers as independent contractors. We see this perhaps in the janitorial industry uh, more frequently, or at least that's what I see through claims um, or cases that come before me, is janitorial workers, for example, being um, classified as contractors when in fact once you go through all of the factors it, it may you know it it it's the case that they are not and again it's important to point out that these are analyzed on a case by case basis so it's not as if an industry is targeted and and boom everyone in that industry is uh you know by virtue of one case all of them become employees or whatnot it is really on a case by case basis that we look at these um so it really depends. So again, we go through the, someone may tip us off uh, and the field enforcement team may be out there conducting an inspection or it can be individual claims filed. And if the deputy handling a wage adjudication complaint comes across um, something that lo looks egregious, they may refer that case to the field enforcement team for investigation. Thank you. And, and how much do you think really is shared because you know I, I have have to I do have to say that I've had probably four or five clients in the last two or three years that were dinged by the workers compensation board and um, they never and they in my opinion had really improperly classified people as contractors um, and they never got dinged by the DLSC so I wonder how much you you think there is cross participation between independent state agencies uh, i can't, it's hard to tell because what comes before me in a hearing are only those cases that get appealed so there may be employers out there or businesses out there that are getting cited that are not appealing and so i i wouldn't from a first-hand experience be able to to say and I'm also not a part of the field enforcement team, so can't really speak to that directly, but the information is being shared, and I know this because um, a few of the citational peer hearings I've conducted are where there is a joint task force. Um, and so that in and of itself shows that information is being shared. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> and, um, Let's see, let's, let's, I think we should probably move along here. So what are the penalties for misclassifying? So um, this is just to give you a sense, um, if the, on the federal level, if you fail to withhold federal taxes, the employer is penalized at a substantially higher rate than if the misclassification is deemed to be intentional. But in California, if that doesn't matter, um, you still have the same penalty. And, um, you know, it depends to some extent on who is doing the penalties. So you can see, um, you know, here is the EDD sanctions. Um, here are the workers' compensation slash DLSE penalties. Um, but, you know, all of these things can apply. And then, you know, you've got to think about um, for the DLSE, um, you're not only going to have the things that I have here on the screen, which are, you know, um, civil penalties and a lien on the property and things like that, but you're going to have, uh, for the classification itself and not paying taxes, um, but you're going to also have these issues like someone could bring a claim for minimum wage, failure to pay minimum wage, because maybe the hours that they worked, um, you know, they weren't, they weren't paid enough, essentially, and the hours that they worked, um, they worked so many hours that they could also have an, un, you know, an unpaid overtime claim. So there are a lot of ways that you can be dinged if you have someone who's working a lot of hours and they're a contractor, uh, and they're made a contractor and not an employee. Um, of course, attorney's fees and costs, um, come up not with the, the DLSC, but in if there's a court case filed. So again, these, these amounts can get pretty astronomical. So what are some things you can do to protect yourself? If you decide to make, someone's a, make someone a contractor, what can you do to help ensure 
that that person is, that that classification is likely going to stick. Um, and, you know, let me just interrupt myself here for a moment, too, to just remind everybody, for those of you who came in late, you can go ahead and send a text to me if you have a question. I'm hoping we're going to have some time at the end to do questions informally as well, so that if you want to be unmuted and just ask the question, you can. But in the meantime, send me a, a chat, and I will try and get the question answered during the presentation. It's just we have a lot of information to go through, and uh, so I'm trying to moderate that a little bit. Okay, so here are some tips that I have found to be helpful. You know, make a file for the, the vendor and have things like maybe a, a printout of their website, a file of their business card, a copy of their invoices, their advertising, anything that shows they're holding themselves out as a business. Oh, insurance would be another good thing. Um, maybe some proof that they have employees. Now, those are all things that are indi gonna indicate that you're dealing with a partner, an equal, someone who holds themselves out as a business who has no interest in being an employee. Um, really be careful not to micromanage. You know, don't tell your contractor how long to stay and what to do. Have your contractor quote you a rate and not the other way around. Pay by the job and not by the hour. And find someone who's advertising their services as opposed to seeking them out. You certainly can seek them out if the other indicia here are strong, but Showing that someone is actively advertising and seeking clients is a great way to show that they're actually legitimately a contractor. I also think a written agreement can be helpful. Um, you can put things in there indicating in a, in, a written, in a written form that there is a lack of control and that you're going to pay them, for example, on a project basis and that the details of that are really up to them have a clear term. So, you know, there's a lot of things that can be passed off as legitimate if they're on a short-term basis. It makes sense that you might want to make someone a contractor for a short period of time on a trial period. Um, but then after that period of time ends, they, they should become an employee if uh, all other indicia are pointing in that direction. And a one-year term would be about the outside of what I would recommend. Um, if you're going to be, you know, contracting with someone for their area of expertise um, and they, you know, are coming in to do a specific project, do, you know, do six months, maybe do a year. You can always renew it if necessary. Have them bring their own tools and supplies and then file. Make sure that you're filing the right paperwork, filing a 1099 and a DA 546 form, which, which is the form that says I've hired a contractor or I, I've um, contracted with a contractor, it shows that you believe your basis to be legitimate, um, your basis for classifying them as a contractor. Anything else you can think of here in Hearing Officer Torres that we should have people doing to back up their classification of someone as a contractor? Uh, well, this is more of an observation if we go back to slide 25. Um, I, I can't really suggest what may be helpful, but I can tell you that a lot of the information that you've just uh, suggested is helpful is relevant in examining a case of an independent contractor versus employee. And also to note, for example, you say have them bring their own tools. That's a little tricky in and of itself because you, if you make someone bring their own tools, that may actually be indicative of control. So whether someone has their own tools and whether you're requiring them to bring their own tools may be an important distinction. So just be aware that these are uh, just suggestions and that they will play themselves out in the context of that relationship and the type of business. Um, so that's just for you to keep in mind. Thank you, that's a good point. And not to mention that if you make them bring their own tools and they're re reclassified as employees, then you're gonna be on the hook for failure to pay business expenses of your employees, which is required in California. Okay, so let's talk about the sharing economy. And here again is where I really think we can get into the ethics portion again. Um, this idea that we've got, you know, economic factors here that really need to go into how you advise your client. So what is the sharing economy? Well, the sharing economy is based on this idea that um, you can share resources and everybody benefits. And usually it's companies that deliver on-demand services, such as driving, dry cleaning, and shipping. 
the businesses tend to have independent, flexible structures, and it usually means that the people that are working for them have the same. So, for example, classic was the Uber case where you had workers who were setting their own schedules, deciding whether to take or refuse jobs. Um, uh, were you know they, they I'm assuming they were writing off their 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 car expenses um, you know they had they could they could decide exactly how much they wanted to work and how little um, so in that way you had um, a lot of independence <clears throat> and you know that in some ways I, I think is really legitimate you've got limited control over your workers but again, thinking back to the yellow cab cases, you know, some might say, and it does seem like the court so far, and in, in the all the rulings on the Uber case so far, um, the the language that was used when they certified the class in that case really suggests that they're not courts aren't looking so much at do you micromanage them on a day to day basis, but rather are they integral to your to your functioning and do you control the overall functioning of the business? If you do, then that person's likely to be an employee. So this, this um, issue of lawsuits has been coming up a lot. Um, we had Lyft um, was sued, Uber has been sued um, and has many lawsuits against it now. Washio, Homejoy, um, and so on. Here's some more. Homejoy, for example, that's a Bay Area based um, home cleaning service, and they just went out of business, um, stating that one of the major factors was all these contractor misclassification suits that they were facing. They just couldn't face it. Uber, fortunately, is not going to have that problem. Um, but of course, this is going to really muck up the waters in terms of how are these sharing economies going to function going forward. And uh, so here is one of the questions that I have about this. Um, when you look at the language um, around this, so, so for example, the uh, plaintiff's attorney who uh, did the Uber case, she's actually also the plaintiff's attorney who won, there was a large federal express case where the drivers claimed that they were misclassified as contractors and they won. And the um, class action attorney in the Uber case said, this is her quote. She said, I don't believe this industry needs to be built on a system whereby the workers don't receive any of the protections that we as a society have decided they need to receive. And she said, I don't know how Uber can argue with a straight face that is a $40 billion company it can't afford to insure its drivers, and so on. And to me, this language um, really implies that this was a choice that Uber made um, because they were cheap, you know, for lack of a better word, and um, that this is a way that Uber is depriving the pe these employees their legitimate rights as employees. I don't know that I agree that it's so simple. I think that, um, again, as I, as I stated in earlier slides, you know, there's a lot of things that are going on that make these, employ these employees or, or workers um, want to be contractors. They have a lot of independence. They, um, there are going to be some economic advantages to them of being a contractor. They can write off their car and their gas. Um, sure, some of that's going to be reimbursed by the employer if they're an employee, but not all of it. Um, so, you know, in some ways it, it's a top toss up for them and there's advantages to being a contractor. Um, I wonder, you know, what you think about this, Hearing Officer Tori, is if you think this is a moral issue, if you think mm -hmm. um, that this idea of not noblesse oblige, but we've got to protect our employees, how much that factors into what's going on right now, and how much do you think attorneys who are trying to comply with their ethical obligations need to think about this aspect of classification? Mm -hmm. uh, well, personally, I, I'm you know, technology, I think, tends to blur the lines of how certain businesses function. Um, a new law, say, as a result of all of this Uber litigation, might offer clarification about uh, some social and moral issues and the sharing economy in and of itself. Who knows? Um, but I do think that the existing legal framework, at least under Borello, I think that 
it's useful and can be applied to a variety of of industries, um, including businesses that are used uh, that use technology-based platforms like Uber. And it's just a matter of understanding the industry and oh, you know, and and seeing what the relationship really is behind that technology. Um, of course, you know, you, you look at these on a case by case basis, but I think that we have the legal tools to make these decisions, whether something better can come along to make this dilemma uh, more, to resolve this dilemma, I, I don't know, I'm not sure, but I think that we have a, a good foundation from which to work. I think that attorneys generally would have um, an obligation, generally speaking, and also depending on each case, uh, there are probably economic, social, and political factors relevant when giving advice, and these will depend on each individual case and, and the particular facts of that industry and that relationship between the worker and the principal. Um, I think one of your slides mentions candid advice. Mm -hmm. And so candid advice uh, about such factors will probably depend on the context of each case. And so you would be giving as an attorney advice, um, not just based on the social or or political factors alone, it would also have to be a careful analysis um, and applicability of facts as to each case that they're dealing with. So there is a lot to consider, especially given this new um, this new issue of of the so-called sharing economy. Right. Okay. Um, so you know, these are just some things to think about. Is that you know, given this subjective standard, what ethical considerations exist for attorneys who need to advise others about this? I think we've addressed that a certain amount. I think hearing officer Torres just did. Um, you know, I think this, to me, this analysis is complicated a little bit by the fact that a 1099 is less expensive for the employer or the, the, the business. Um, and so, um, to me, in some senses, the ethical advice is, is not just, um, it's not just doing a cost benefit analysis, it's advising your, your business that, you know, you need to understand the political tide, here's what the political tide says, you need to understand the socioeconomic factors. Um, and, um, you know, it also seems to me like, um, going back to sort of the, the sharing economy issue, that in some ways, the classification um, has the classification of workers has not caught up um, uh, to um, th these economies. I, I remember when this Uber case was first um, filed, that one of the judges basically said, "You know, how are we going to have a jury decide this? I mean, we've got." They're going to have to decide whether to put these workers in a circle or in a square, uh, circular or a square hole, and neither one applies. Um, and I wonder what you think about that. If you think there's some ways, hearing officer Torres, that we just haven't caught up yet with the new realities that a sharing economy brings. Uh, well, just this touches on the point I just sort of brought up, and that's that the laws already exist. It really might be an issue of describing the technology and how that, how that, um, you know, how that's relevant in that specific context. And so, and again, you know, I personally think that technology tends to blur that line, but understanding what it is, understanding what the business is and what the business is providing to, um, as a service to to its clients is is more important in in acknowledging what kind of or determining what kind of relationship really exists um, the the laws are already designed to protect workers i feel uh, and the fact that the sharing economy is such a hot button issue right now is is i think just merely raising an awareness of the scale and and degree to which the law really applies um, Let's take, for example, the presumption that the worker providing the services is, is an employee. 
that's part of the design that's there to protect the workers um, and the employer having to pre the presumed employer having to overcome that pre that presumption mm -hmm. is also built into that. So that's part of the framework that I think is is already there um, to to um, to benefit the worker at at that level. Yes. Great. I mean, I think <clears throat> I think that's important. And I, I guess I would just say for the attorneys out there that I think you know I think I. I Part of what I wanted to do this, what I wanted you to get from this presentation was a sense of these political social factors that there is this desire to protect workers. Um, and there are these new cases that are challenging the current system because this is a complex issue. And I, I think to properly advise clients, you have to have an understanding of all of this. Um, I think this is made further complex by, and this is addressing somebody's question, the fact that um, we have now have staffing agencies um, I, I guess I would ask, you know, what do you think that throws into the mix, uh, hearing officer Torres? Do you think that if, if someone's using a staffing agency, they're pretty safe um, from being classified as an employer or not necessarily? Not necessarily. Yeah. And, and again, that goes to show that the kind of business that you are using or that your company model might require some control that may be indicative of an employment relationship, whether or not you use uh, a, an employment agency or a third party agency to contract these workers. Um, you know, we, we have cases that are agencies and then the clients for which services are provided by the agency and then the worker ends up making claims against both. And so we then have to analyze whether there's an existing employment relationship between both. And so that that may actually be implicating multiple parties in, in, a, in litigation or through the claim process of the labor commissioner. Great. Okay, um, couple, I just wanna go through um, one more slide because we're really um, we're really getting close on time and I want to talk about a few housekeeping items at the end in terms of when you'll get your MC, your CLE credit and, and the presentation when it'll be up um, but let's let's just get a sense of what the penalties are so here's a company um, that this is a, these are based on real life scenarios so a small company in size it doesn't need to classify two service providers as workers in issues of 1099 for three years in the amount of 60K a year or $360,000 total, if both the EDD and the IRS audit and reclassify these people as employees, here's what will happen. The unintentional misclassification with a 1099 file, because remember California cares about that, is gonna be $80,000. The unintentional misclassification, no 10, 1099 file, will be $86,000. And intentional misclassification is going to be a whopping 146 to 174 K depending on a couple of, of other factors. Um, likewise, you know, here's, um, here's a situation um, that I got from a, a staffing agency, a, a nanny staffing agency. Um, they had a, a nanny, they didn't treat her as an employee, they paid her under the table. She, they paid 15 to 20 percent more taxes than they would have paid if they had treated her as an employee. Um, and they, there was an optional $250,000 penalty assessment that the IRS was considering imposing on the family. So you can see ways that it really doesn't pay off um, to, mis, to misclassify. A couple of key takeaways here. The standard subjective, that makes it, that's what makes it, I think, a, a trickier issue to advise on for attorneys than some others. Government prefers employee status. I think that's clear by now. You should back up your decision. Um, <clears throat> you know, make a file, have a contract in place, so on. And uh, there's many ways the government can find out. And I think everything shows that the government is only going to get more strict in enforcement, not less. Um, here are a couple resources you can use um, that I think are really good. And I do also blog on this, this issue a lot. Um, finally, you can contact myself anytime with questions. Um, a couple of, of housekeeping items. So you will get an email later today asking you to do a very quick feedback survey. And then once you go through that survey, you will be um, taken to the materials. So you'll have the PowerPoint that you can have access to and download if you like. 
Um, and I think the webinar recording will be up at that point too. And if, if not, it will be available shortly after. Um, I will, um, all those that showed up today, I will be emailing you a, um, uh, um, a statement of credit of MCLE participation um, later today. And, um, and then for those, if, if anybody else, anybody else who wants to just see the materials or get the recording, that will be available for everybody else to see next week. I wanted to give some advantages to um, the people that actually, um, excuse me, I'm just looking at a message here, wanted to um, give an advantage to, to those that filled out the survey. Um, so um, I think we're at time. I, uh, it's one o'clock, so I think that is really it. Um, I'm gonna bid adieu to everyone. Thank you for being here. I hope it was a valuable presentation. And um, please feel free, again, you're gonna get a link to the forum. Really honest, candid feedback would be great. Ideas for future presentations would be great. Anything that would be helpful. And those of you who asked questions that I didn't get to, I'm happy to answer those offline. You can call me or you can email me, um, or I'll try and contact you as well. Thank uh, you. Thanks, Diana. Thanks for everyone. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for your time. We so appreciate it.